him here. Randy Lewis is not only, I'm tempted to say, typical US businessman, he is as well a disability employment advocate and he is a bestseller author of the bestseller No Greatness Without Goodness. The book is still available, I can tell you, and it's really worth reading. And last but not least, he is a wonderful keynote speaker and we are really looking forward to hear him. But before we do, let me add some more insights to Randy Lewis. He was senior vice president of a Fortune 50 company, board member of a national restaurant chain. He was the head of supply chain and logistics at Walgreens for 17 years. And over his last 10 years there, he created a program in its distribution centers to integrate a really large number of people with disabilities as equals into its workforce. I think that's why nobody is more dedicated and skilled to give answer to the question why I hired a workforce nobody would. Please give a warm applause to our keynote speaker Wish from Chicago, Mr. Luck. Randy Lewis. Thank you, so Thank you. Well, let's start with a movie. Uh, this is a movie that uh, came on our national news in the United States about our first building where when we went, what we said, go big. And so you'll let it, it will provide a context for what everything else I'll, I'll say. So let's see if this works. Welcome to World News. Tonight, the work in progress. An employer proving disabled people will work just as hard as anyone else, if given the chance. From ABC News headquarters, this is World News. And when we come back, the company whose workforce is almost half disabled. And you might be surprised by the results. Finally tonight, an economic success story that is, more importantly, a human success story. A recent study found that the unemployment rate for Americans with disabilities is 44 percent. There are laws against discrimination, but many employers still question whether disabled people can really do the job. Betsy Stark found one company with some answers. At first glance, this Walgreens distribution center in Anderson, South Carolina, seems ordinary enough. But look a little closer. I'll tell you what, I love this job. And it is anything but. I have been happy with it. I'm contented. And I've, I've got people all around me that's the best friends I've ever had in the whole world. What's special about this place is that Julia Turner and more than 40% of her 700 co-workers are disabled. Julia has Down syndrome. Daryl Perry, who works right next to her, mentally retarded. What are these things, Daryl? It tells you all kinds of tips. Oh, so these are tips on how to do your job? Do my job. Garrick Tada has autism. Morning, R. Luann Bannister, one of their training supervisors, in a wheelchair. And Angela Mackey, who recruited most of them. You feel a little better? Yeah. Angie has cerebral palsy. I hope that, you know, through my work and through this program I'm showing, that disability or not, we all have potential, we all have value. In this building, abled and disabled workers do many of the same jobs and earn the same pay. Corporate America thinks they need to give somebody with a disability an easier job. Everyone here is on equal ground. Can you please take care of that for me? Yes, sir. I know in this building, people with disabilities How you doing, man? are not invisible. And you see somebody with, with a disability, everybody avoids that person. Here, we come up and shake your hand. It's totally different. The quiet revolution happening in Anderson is the brainchild of Walgreens executive Randy Lewis. Everything okay? <laughs> Lewis has a 19-year-old son with autism. I was a parent. I saw the future. And so the question is, given our position, maybe we could be an example. Maybe we could use our position of leadership to try to change the work environment. This was personal. 
Very personal. Very personal. Lewis says Anderson is no less productive than other distribution centers. People come to me and say, will this work in my environment? Yes, it will. How you doing, Stephanie? This is, this is the, not just the good thing to do, the right thing to do. This is better. Does it make you feel good to it get sure a does. paycheck every week? <laughs> and if anybody needs a big check, come over here and we'll give, they'll give it to you. But only if you earn it. Betsy Stark, ABC News, Anderson, South Carolina. Does anybody know who Walgreens is? Have you ever shopped there? Thank you. Thank you. So this is your story, too. Uh, Walgreens has about 8,000 stores in the United States. It has now about $135 billion in sales, so it's a, a big company. And we have 17 distribution centers, large distribution centers across the United States. Now to give you, so when you see this story, how did we ever do this? Let me ask you, how many of you have children? And the, I assume that those who don't were children once, so we, this is going to be an inclusive story. Here is, here is my family. Boy, girl, boy, girl. My son there in the middle, who is now 30, has autism. Uh, he was diagnosed at three. We noticed that uh, he wanted to keep running off. He didn't, uh, he didn't talk that much. He, started, he spoke and then he quit speaking at about age three. He liked men more than women and we finally got him tested and we got that bad news. He didn't talk at three. He didn't talk at four, five, six, seven, eight, at ten he started speaking. And if you ever get a chance to talk to him, you will think he's trying to make up for lost time. <laughs> he loves Michael J. Fox. Uh, what else? 1980s cars, classic cars, American Airlines, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so he's a compatriot of sorts. He has a wonderful sense of humor, and he drives. He was the first person in the school system with autism to drive. Now his sister failed on the left, that's his younger sister, Allison. She failed her driver's test twice. <laughs> and one day, Allison has some friends over to the house and they're sitting around the table talking and Austin's on the side. And all of a sudden, Austin says, Elmer, Allison failed her driver's test twice. You can imagine Allison was not very happy about that, and I overheard this, so I thought I will give some real-time coaching. Austin, you can't talk about Allison's driver's test. You can only talk about your own driver's test. Elmer, on my driver's test, I did not back over a yard, meaning a garden of a neighbor. So, Austin is the driver in the family. He drives me to the airport. He didn't drive me two weeks ago when I started my trip to get to Austria. But he drives me. He'll get up, he'll get up early in the morning. He'll come late at night. He'll bring my bag downstairs. And I pay him $20 to take me to the airport. A, uh, a limousine or a cab would cost $80. I don't tell Austin what they would charge me, but he's okay with 20. He's okay with 20. <laughs> and as a capitalist, I figure he's using my equipment, so I justify the, <laughs> the difference in pay. But every experience is the same. Every experience is the same. He will get up, bring the bag down, get me in the car, and we'll get to the airport, and he'll drive me in front. I'm usually of United. That's where I fly most. And every time, it's the same experience. I'll turn to him and I'll say, Austin, you got up early, you got us here safely and on time. Thank you and I love you. And every time, Austin will turn to me and say, $20. <laughs> so does money make a difference? Yes, it does. Now, Austin has challenges. He probably reads at probably the sixth 
sixth year of primary school or seventh, he, he has no friends. He has no peer friends. He's never been invited to a party. He's never gotten an email. He does text. And I've never played a game with my own son. And when it comes to getting a job, if he's like other people with autism, he would never have a chance at a job. Now, those of us parents who do have children with disabilities, we share a common, I found we share a common hope to live one day longer than our child because we know what's waiting. And usually in, our, in the United States, in our school system, at 23 or 24, they're thrown out of the school system, left to compete with people who are much better prepared. And a job is something we start thinking about as parents almost the instant we get the bad news because a job can mean security. A job can mean friends. A job can mean a full life. So what are we going to do? So here we are, and I'm seeing Austin. The gift all our children give us, they all give us a different gift. The gift that Austin gave me was to see the person, not the disability. To see the full and complete person who surprised me over and over again by the things he could do that I would have never dreamed of. Taking that lesson and then finding in my professional life, here we are, this big successful company. We're growing. In my division that I was responsible for, we're hiring a thousand people a year. So it was a very simple thought. If Walgreens couldn't do something about this, who could? And if I wouldn't, who will? So we first started out, we didn't, now, I have to tell you that we, we only make three cents on the dollar. Our net margin is three cents on the dollar. And those of you who work in, in, in private enterprise, that's a very low margin. And we have shareholders and we have to be competitive. So we started out, so we're not going to spend any money. So that's a good business person right there, a good perspective. So we just, what we did, we, we went out to agencies and said, can you bring in people with disabilities with your management and we'll give you the custodial work or this non-critical work and you, you can do this. It's called an enclave. And we did that for about four years and everybody thought we were the best corporate citizen in the world. They were calling us to give us awards that we were helping all these people with disabilities. But I was at a visit at one of those centers and a woman showed me a picture she showed me a picture and it, she was in it and I was confused and she said, oh, the, the group is great, but, but I'm not one of them. I'm their sponsor. And I heard that word, them. And I thought, we're not doing what we hope to do. They weren't doing the same jobs as everyone else. They weren't earning the same wages. And they weren't us. So we thought, We've had folks in our building. Why don't we take the ones we think will be successful and ask for volunteer team members to work with them as, as peer mentors, and let's give it a go. Why not? So one of the people we hired was this young man named Chuck. Chuck is, has autism, and uh, we learned Chuck is kind of what we call weird. Now. Parents of children with disability, with uh, autism, we aspire for our child to become weird. That's, that's the high end on, on, the, on the spectrum. So I say that not in a pejorative way, but in a way, in a loving way. Chuck was weird. And for instance, we learned his favorite color is purple. And the reason we learned that is because once or twice a day, a purple tote would pass by Chuck and he would stop, start dancing, and yelling and letting everybody know that there's a purple tote in his area. Something we'd never seen. So management got to thinking, is this appropriate for the workplace? But very quickly, when they started thinking about it, which do we prefer, dancing or complaining? <laughs> dancing, complaining. 
Let's go with dancing. Let's go with dancing. Chuck taught us that performance comes in different packages. And when I talked to the, to the two ladies that he worked alongside, when I was on a visit there, I said, there's 500 people in this building. Has anybody ever made a comment about Chuck? That he makes them nervous or he's weird or something like that? And she said, no. But if they do, they're going to have a problem with us. Now we were making progress. Now we were making progress. So, when time comes along, we knew we were going to build a new center that was going to open up in South Carolina. And we needed it to be big, and we needed it to be efficient, and it was going to be our most productive center we would ever built, our most advanced in the world. And we went all over the world looking for the right technology to make this the most productive building. And do you know where we ended up? Graz, Austria. Ground zero of logistics automation. And that's who we selected to, to build this building. So we, had, we knew what we wanted to do. And we also thought, we think this automation, why don't we go big? We're going into a new building. We'd hired people here and there using peer mentors, you know, two to one. It seemed to work. So let's go big. And, and let's really hire people with disabilities. Now we said, if we're going to do this, we have to have a couple of rules. One is we're going to make sure we want jobs, not jobs for people with disabilities. All we have is jobs. Because if we have jobs for people with disabilities, we'll assume somebody with autism can't do this. They like repetitive stuff. Or somebody that's blind, they won't be able to get around. Or somebody that's deaf can't hear a horn. Let's start with jobs. Let's start with jobs, not jobs for people with disabilities. Same jobs, same pay. Same jobs, same pay. And we wanted a number that would inspire us. So we're going to have 600 people in this building. So we remembered Chuck and these other ones out there. So we said, let's have one third of the entire workforce, 200 people to be people with disabilities. Now we knew we didn't, have, we didn't have a model. No big company had ever done something like this before, but it was an inspirational goal. And when the board asked about it, they said, what if it doesn't work? And we said, like any other thing that doesn't work, we try lots of things, we'll adjust. And they said, okay. <laughs> and then when the people who had to implement it said, what if it doesn't work, will I get in trouble or whatever? We said, give it your best. If we need to adjust a policy or something, we'll try to do that. But our standard is to sleep well at night. So if, we're fi if it doesn't work, we're going to tell the world that no one else can do this because we could not. And they took that and added all their creativity, and we started to take off. But we knew that we would have problems. We knew that our typical way of finding, hiring, Screening, training, onboarding, everything was tilted in favor of people who are typically able. We had unintended biases. They don't have the uh, background we're looking for. They probably don't look the interviewer in the eye. They don't have all that experience, all those things that we look for. For example, if you went my son on an interview, because you use an interview, typically you, have, you look at the qualifications as they get through that, through the paper. You may call them and see if they have the qualifications and screen them that way for technical. And if they get past that, you get that final interview for a fit. Are they a good fit for us? Is that the way you do it here? Okay, well, if you do it better, let us know because we screwed up a lot of stuff doing what we do. But if Austin, if that, that final interview, you would ask a question. I know that Michael would probably ask a question like this. Why would you like to work here? That's a great question. And my son would say, how would I know? I've never worked here. <laughs> and we would go, next. <laughs> so we knew we needed a different way to screen and to reveal the gifts of, of, of those. So we said we need an alternative door. 
an alternative door without the resume, without the experience, and, and we were going to let people demonstrate their expertise. Have two doors. We're just going to take our existing door and open it wider. We weren't going to lower the bar on performance, but just an alternative way for people to select. And how it worked was very simply. We said, okay, let's think of ours. We have a center here. First of all, we don't know disabilities, so we need to go out and find an agency partner who knows people with disabilities, who understands them, and can screen them for us. So the first thing we want them to do is pre-screen them, understand our jobs, and then without a job history or interview, what we're going to do is we're going to bring them in. They come in. We will supervise them, and they bring in job coaches, and we're going to have a, we call them interns, nine weeks to prove and paid during that nine weeks. And once they demonstrate performance after that nine weeks, they're hired. As simple as that. A model that we'd used with temps, a model we'd used with interns, but using people with disabilities. That was what we were going to do. So when we did this, we made, we made this announcement you would have thought that we cured cancer. 200 people, we were going to hire 200 people in the United States. Been, you know, how many people we have in the United States? 200 people with disabilities, and it made the Wall Street Journal. And everybody, it was a situation so desperate for people with disabilities that it was national news that you saw that, what, we, what you just saw. One of the people who saw this, now, I don't know if you know geography that well, this woman here, Desiree, lived on, uh, in San Diego. If this is the United States, that's over there. The distribution center is in South Carolina. That's over there. Desiree Neff was in uh, San Diego working at a temp agency. Now, Desiree has a rare muscle condition that requires that she use a walker sometimes. So one day she shows up to work with her walker, and her boss says, What's the deal with the walker? Desiree says, I don't need it all the time, but I do need it sometimes. And he said, great. Come back when you don't. Desiree moved her family across the United States a year before we opened just for the chance to apply. And today she is a manager in that building. And truth be told, if we had not been looking for people with disabilities, we would have passed on Desiree too. Because we would have seen the walker and we would, our typical approach is we would like our people to be able to get to all parts of the building, to work in all parts of the building. And we had some areas with stairs that she would have difficulty. So we would probably take a pass on her. But we didn't, and lucky us. Now people will ask, what disabilities could we not have in the building? I remember, I remember somebody asked about mental illness. Mental Ill illness is scary. Are we, we going to hire people with mental illness? And I had not thought about it. I had not, and I got to thinking, kind of like the dancing thing, I got to thinking, I know I know with 240,000 employees, I know we have people who are paranoid. I know we have people who have obsessive compulsive disorder. I know we have people with explosive anger disorder. I know people who have shifting personalities. And that's just a senior executive team at the Walgreens company. <laughs> Why not? We have not found a single disability that we would disqualify. Because everything is a spectrum. We can't hire all people with autism, but we can hire a lot. And we can't hire every typically able person either. Everything's a spectrum. And we got some great employees. Angie, remember seeing Angie with the, with the CP? She made magna cum laude out in graduate school. Had 30 in-person interviews when she got out of graduate school and not a single job offer. Angie is probably the best HR person I have ever worked with. 
And we would not have hired Angie either because we would have thought, we have a lot of noise out there and people have difficulty understanding her. Or maybe she will make people feel uncomfortable. Or if we have a fire, Angie has what she calls her sexy walk because of the, the CP. Maybe we need to go to the next person. And we had Harrison. Harrison came out of the school system, has autism. He looks a little different now. This, this was taken in 2017. I just saw him two months ago. He's got a, he looks like the law, a lot of 27-year-olds now, 28-year-olds. He's got a beard and a ball cap, and he's got a headset. Harrison came out of the school system. He cannot multiply 10, uh, what's the number? 10 times 60 because he could do 10 cases a minute. And I said, how many can you do in an hour? He didn't know. I said, well, that's 10 times 60. I had to think about it. He didn't know the answer. I knew the answer, 600. <laughs> we hoped for 400. Here's a young man who does 150% of expectation, who can't multiply, who would never have gotten through the application form. And he does every job at 150%. And the reason he has a microphone on, because he runs a line in that center today. And Harrison is the, is the person people call when the trucks have to leave and everybody's running behind. Send Harrison over to help us catch up. We would have missed out on that. So how did the building turn out? It turned out to be the most productive center in the hundred year history of our company. All we wanted was the same performance. The most productive. And we public, we studied the data and we published it. Here's what it said. People with disabilities perform the same as better. And you can look this up. We published it. Safety. People with disabilities work safe, safer. Our safety costs are lower. How can that be? Here's the secret. They follow the rules. <laughs> Retention is better. Absenteeism is better. We, I don't know, you don't have the event. We have an event in the United States that uh, there's a flu that goes through the country one day a year in the United States, the day after the Super Bowl. I don't know if you have that, you don't have that here. but. It, Incredible. No, but everybody gets sick. This is a group of people who show up. <laughs> Absenteeism is less. And because retention is better, we've learned that the 30% uh, the now becomes 40% because the typically abled workforce is turning over and the better retention is staying in with the people with disabilities. The, uh, the secret, I'm going to tell you a little bit of secret how it works because people say, well, how can you get this many people with disabilities to do this? This is in English. I don't know what the three letters would be in German. A, T, P. Ask the person. For instance, uh, if a person applied for a job handling cases, our procedure says use two hands. So if a person came with one arm or one hand, we'd say you're not qualified. Now we say how would you do the job? We show them the job. How would you do it? because they probably have a lifetime of trying to figure that stuff out. Or uh, deaf. Deaf lift drivers. Everybody familiar with forklifts here? Uh, they're they're kind of like, you don't have Priuses over here, do you? Priuses are, are our electric car, Toyota. Well, they're, they're like forklifts. They're like, for, they're like for, well, forklifts are like Priuses except they're not, they don't have any smugness about them for the people who are driving them. But a forklift, the procedure on a forklift is to honk the horn anytime they're near pedestrians. Anytime they come to an intersection, honk the horn so that pedestrians will know that they're in the area. So forklifts cannot be driven by deaf people because they can't test their horn. So, but we said, let's ask a deaf person, how would you test your horn to make sure it works? First person. What I would do, I would place my hand on the cowling, I would push the button, 
I would feel it vibrate. Good answer. So we ask another person, how would you test your horn? He said, what I would do is I would pull up behind a group of people who are just talking, <laughs> touch the horn and see who jumps. <laughs> ask the person. Over and over and over, we came across this. Now, the, the astounding thing, though, about this, and I hope that you will come. I know it's a long way. I hope you come for yourself and see this and ask all the questions you might have. Because we, we, one of the things that we did on the front, we said one-third of the uh, workforce, but we also said we're going to do something different. We're going to give it all away what we learned. When we're done and we're successful, we're going to give this away even to our competitors. We're going to open our doors and let them come in and see for themselves and ask all the questions. And if they want to put people here for a week or two weeks to work, to understand this, we're going to give it all away. And that gave it power. People wanted to do something bigger than, than them. Now, what convinces most people to come or to do something is when they talk to managers, not when they see people with disabilities or see any of those numbers. That's never convinced anybody to do this. Talking to managers and listening to them talk about what it is like to work here. So what better way than instead of telling you what they said, to show you what they said. A student, when he was getting out of a film school, came to make a film about people with disabilities. And he interviewed a lot of people. The movie he made was not about the people with disabilities. It was about the managers talking about what it is to work with people with disabilities and the impact on culture. So let's see what they have to say. Oh, by the way, there was a study done on it that confirms it. So now movie time. The one element that I've never allowed into my management style, nor into any facility that I've ever been into, and that's managing with love, managing with care, managing with a heart. That's the big change here. It's all about the people. To manage and be successful in our building, you have to focus on the individual. Everybody has a different motivator. And it's up to the man to define out what that motivator is. It takes a lot of creativity and to come in with no fear. I am allowed to be creative with the team members. That it's not a hard line stance to where either you get it or you don't get it. It's an opportunity to see what the issue is and work with that team member. That relationship that you make with an individual, whether they have a disability or not, makes or breaks that person's success. We are very focused in this building on making folks successful. As far as the key indicators that we look at for safety and productivity, we are the number one in our division. We started each day as one. When Daryl made production, we all made production. When Melissa did excellent at accuracy, we all did excellent with accuracy. When John worked safely, we all worked safely. It changes the whole culture of a building you would have a team that thinks about other people before they think about themselves. We've all been changed. It's made me a better manager. It's made me a better man. It's made me a better father and a better husband. I'm a better leader because of it. I got more compassion, got more patience, which has not always been a strong suit of mine. I see folks for who they are now, as opposed to what they look like.
this is what that first group, that's that first building. That's how many people with disabilities are in that building. Most had never found it, had a job before. All make the same pay, have benefits, have 401ks for, you know, for retirement, medical coverage, all that, off, off of welfare. We put a bus, uh, we talked the city into bringing a bus, city bus, by the, the center. And we built a, a cover in case it was raining. Because we knew people, we thought people with disabilities, we know people with disabilities may not drive. And I was there one day, and we, I know we have 200 people working there, and nobody was waiting for the bus. And I asked Angie, remember Angie? I asked Angie, I said, why aren't more people riding the bus? And she said, you know, when you pay people a living wage, they'll figure out how to get to work. I mean, they, we keep learning and learning. So how does it look today? So this, build, this was our first building. We opened the building like it last, the two years later. And then we realized it was not about this wonderful Austrian automation that we had. It was about the will to do it. The willingness to be creative, to aim big and try to go big. And we did it in all our centers. And that's what it looks like going to look like in 2020. It's about 1,800 now. It'll be 20% of our entire workforce by 2020. And we stayed loyal to the opening up our doors, and we've probably had over two or 300 companies come through, big companies too. And some of those you may, you may know, Amazon, Best Buy. Amazon, I don't know if, we, I don't know if they, we let them in there because they are pretty secretive. But the rest of these we did. Apple. Uh, Marks and Spencer in the UK, you can see that they did the exact same thing that we did. So in northern England, you can go, I hope you can go visit Marks and Spencer, uh, Toyota Manufacturing. Now, when we did this, I was asked a question by a reporter this morning saying, yes, but that's logistics. Everybody knows that people with disabilities can work in logistics. When we started, nobody was working in logistics. So that's good now that people think it's logistics, but we need more manufacturing, like Toyota is doing this and Crown Equipment, the large manufacturer of, uh, of uh, forklifts and heavy equipment. Some of these other names you may know, Starbucks. And here's the nice thing. One of these companies is, is Meyer. They're in the Midwest. You probably wouldn't know their name. They're, they're kind of like Walmart, but they're only in six states. They did this. And I didn't, had no idea that this could benefit my son. We don't have any centers near us. But the president called me up and he said, we're opening up a center on the border of, of Wisconsin and Illinois near Chicago. If your son can get there, if Austin can get there, we'd like him to be one of our first employees. So for three years, that son who used to take me to the airport drives an hour each way to work full-time, benefits and all, the only person in the Lewis household with a steady paycheck. <laughs> now, the only thing I think could improve this, and in Archer Daniel, uh, Archer Daniel Mid Midland, they're a big company. They're not in, in logistics, they're in manufacturing. Again, the only thing that would make this picture better is to put up a lot of Austrian companies up to that's what I would like to do. And in talking to Martin last night, I think he's pretty well devoted to try to make Austria the model for disability employment in the world, where everybody comes here to learn, because there's so many examples around. And he's devoted to that. And I will help him with everything I got to do that if you choose to do it. But there's no reason you cannot. Please believe that. So, in summary, this was about doing effective in business, but also at the same time making a positive impact on society. It's too many times we got to say, are we going to make money or are we going to do good? The answer is yes, not either or. The difference between what, what is and what can be, what is and what should be, are ordinary people like all of us in this room, invested with a certain amount of power, who see a need, 
who jump into the breach, pick up the yoke, and try to move the world forward a millimeter at a time. Ordinary people like us. And like I said, there are Austrian fingerprints all over this already. And I hope to see more. Thank you very, very much. Oh, you have questions? We have questions, of course, yeah. We take the chance as long as you're here. How do you select your employees? Do you select based on objective criteria? Uh, well, if on the alternative way, the objective criteria, can they do the job? Were they able to demonstrate they can do the job? Mm -hmm. Both doors are open to all people. But... We, we did have a target. There's a question about discrimination. Uh, it was a question about discrimination of non-disabled okay. people because this fits very good to this question, I guess. Okay, here, here is the trick. Okay, first of all, let's take the, the legal answer and the moral answer. Yeah. Okay. The legal answer is the only people you discriminate when you hire people with disabilities are people without disabilities. And that is not a protected class. The... People with disabilities is an all-inclusive class. It has every other minorities, women, it has everybody. Yeah, that's the legal answer, so it's not against the law. And oh, by the way, I have not heard a single complaint about this because we took it out to all the buildings and told them what we were going to do. And they wanted us to do it. And you know how, how we did it? I was in a meeting with 5,000 store managers. And I asked after I finished this, who of, you, who of you has somebody in your heart with a disability stand up? And a thousand people stood up. This is everybody's problem. 